please sign up for that on the on the app as well. Um, and that's the thing. So let's uh, let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you that your word is life. I pray, Father, as we spend time in your word this morning, that you stir us, that you build our faith. Father, let us be your instruments in the world today, and we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So two weeks ago, we uh, began to talk to you about signs, wonders, and miracles. We spent time looking at the healing ministry of Jesus. Um, when we read the scripture, we should be looking at patterns that are in the scripture so that we can, uh, we can understand principles for godly living and so we can build our faith. You don't read the Bible just to have brain knowledge or to you know, pass the time or to get a steak dinner. You read the Bible to see patterns which gives you principles which builds your faith. And so we looked at Jesus' um, public ministry of healing. That should be on our YouTube channel, which you can subscribe to, Statesburg New Covenant Church out there and um, his public healing. So we learned from that that Jesus publicly healed a whole lot of people to point people to God. Okay, that's the summary sentence of that sermon. Um, so I want to take a moment and, and look at Luke 13 this morning, and then we're going to talk about some of the principles of healing from the patterns that we saw two weeks ago. So in Luke 13... We find this story in uh, verse 10 where Jesus heals a crippled woman. So follow along. It says, on a Sabbath, Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues. And a woman was there who had been crippled by a spirit for 18 years. I'm sorry, but that's a really, really long she was bent over and could not straighten up at all. Now, I want you to get the picture. So there's a synagogue, which is a, a small local Jewish gathering, and, and they would have been in whatever community this was in. And so they're, they're having service, and they, they, they're reading the scripture, and they're praying. And so then this woman, she comes in, and she's bent over, and she walks in, right? So how are you walking in? kind of bent over. She, she can't look up, right? She's just, every, everybody knew her. Like, oh, here she is. You know, let's get out, get out of her way because she can't really see where she's going. She's looking at the floor. She, she spends all of her time walking down the road looking at camel droppings, donkey do. That's all you got. Walking around, and so she's doing this. She probably had a little cane or a stick or some sort of deal. And she walks in to this synagogue She's been there who knows how many times, but Jesus is there at this time. Verse 12, when Jesus saw her, we, it doesn't say this, but we know that he had compassion for her because he heals motivated by compassion. He saw her and he called her forward and said to her, now, now think about this. She's walking, you're bent over like this. Walking forward, that's, that's just more effort. Right? Hey, come on up here. I was like, oh, man, don't make everybody look at me. I'm already kind of embarrassed as it is that this is my life and this is the way I am. But he calls her forward. She comes up, and he says to her, woman, you are set free from your infirmity. That's a declaration that is taking a divine truth and applying it to this person. Then he put his hands on her, and immediately she straightened up, stuck her hands in her pockets, and shuffled home like nothing was going on. Is that what it said? She straightened up, and can you imagine what her praise was like in that moment? Just, just stick with me for just a second. Do you think that she went from 18 years of this to, and her response was, hmm. Do you think it was like one of those little, you know. I'm thinking that this would be a really good time for me to know how to dance. But I don't. So 
I'm thinking that she probably went nutso. I mean, wouldn't you? 18 years of her saying, God, help me. God, I'm suffering. God, I'm struggling. God, things are difficult. I've gone to every doctor. I've gone to all these things. I've tried to fix it. I can't. I can't even stand up straight. I can't get stuff off the top shelf. I'm a mess. Help me out. And then all of a sudden, instantly encountering Jesus, she would have, it doesn't say, yelled, screamed, danced, run around the room, jumped up and down, high-fived everyone in the room if there was such a thing back then. I mean, don't you think? I mean, she probably would have been up there going, you know, Ooh, ah, mm, yeah. <laughs> right? She would have been super excited about this. Could you imagine being in the room and here's Jesus and this happens right in front of you? Wouldn't that have just like blown your mind and changed you forever? And watching her reaction would have been astounding, would have been so exciting to be there and to see this. That must have been amazing. I wish it was on YouTube. Because she would have been going for it. It would have been awesome. So then we go to the next verse. Verse 14. Indignant. Because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath. The synagogue leader said to the people, there are six days for work. So come and be healed on those days and not on the Sabbath. How many of you guys know people like that? All right. Now, now the word indignant, I think, is a word that we don't use too terribly often. And so as I was reading this, I thought, you know, I'm going to kind of dig a little bit and kind of see what the word indignant means. And based, based on the Greek, indignant means much grief. And the root word in the Greek, uh, and I'll just give you all my secrets, blue, uh, blue letter Bible dot org or com gives you Greek and Hebrew roots. You can look stuff up. It's super easy. I got all the books in my office, but that's easier, so check it out. So the root word for indignant is the crossing of arms. Can't you see your mama? Okay. Johnny, for real. Right? How many, how many of you guys, your mom kind of gave you this, this action, right? A little tap of the foot, maybe the glasses down the end. Right? And, and so the synagogue leader is indignant. He is grieved because Jesus has performed this miracle, but he's looking at, the, he's looking at it saying Jesus worked. And this, this is super important. Jesus would not violate the Sabbath. Jesus did not do work when he healed her. Because work implies labor, work implies difficult. What Jesus was doing is Jesus was reestablishing divine order in her body. We live in a natural world, and you naturally have problems that are wrong with your body, and Jesus is reestablishing the divine order of perfect and healed and healthy and whole in her body that wasn't work. Does that make sense? And so this guy, this synagogue leader, was indignant, grieved and angry because Jesus has set this woman free after 18 years. I don't know. I'm, I mean, he's lucky. Because I think I would have said something. You know, how many of you go, you want to take us outside? She's running around the room dancing, praising, kicking her heels up. Woo! She's all excited, and he's like, I can't believe you did this on the Sabbath. So Jesus responds, verse 15, <clears throat> the Lord answered him, you hypocrites. Ouch. A hypocrite 
we, we use that word, right? Church people are hypocrites. The word hypocrite comes from the Greek drama scene where they would use a mask to portray a different character. Okay, and so you would have the mask, you would have the sad mask. Like you guys, whenever you see like, you know, hey, we have theater or drama, they have little masks up there. You Like you've seen that in some sort of theater advertising or whatever. That mask was called hypocrisy. Because I can be me, but then I can put the mask on, now I can be happy, now I can be sad, now I can be whatever I am. And so Jesus is saying to him, hey, you, you guys are fake, you're pretending, you're putting on the airs of I'm upset, but on the inside there's something else going on. You're putting on the airs of I'm a religious, righteous person, but on the inside there's something else going on. You're hiding. That is hypocrisy. Does that make sense? And so he looks at him and he says, hypocrites, doesn't each of you on the Sabbath untie your ox or donkey from the stall and lead it out to give it water? In other words, don't you feed your pets in the morning? That's basically what he's saying. Okay. Then should not this woman, the daughter, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has kept bound for 18 long years, be set free on the Sabbath day? From what, from what bound her, verse 17, then when he said all this, all his opponents were humiliated, good, but the people, the people that were in the synagogue, the people that were like walking on the street and heard sister, whatever her name was, all shouting, screaming, and dancing around, and they started coming in because that was the society of there's all these people out in the street, and so they start coming in. All the people were delighted with all the wonderful things he was doing, and to me, the word delighted and the word, the word indignation, like they contrast each other. What Jesus is doing should be a delight to us. And if our, re- if our response to what Jesus is doing is indignation, then, then guys, we're missing it. There's something going on. Look, look at all those people up there worshiping and jumping around. That's, that's so wrong. There's a, that's a problem. God's moving over there, but I just don't think that's really a thing that should be going on. So he has called us to delight in the works of the Lord, not be indignant because it doesn't fit inside our little boxes of our little imaginations of what we think is right. So, this reminds us a whole lot of important things. Again, we're heading towards principles. This reminds us that there's nothing impossible for Jesus. Okay, 18 years this woman is sick. 18 years. I mean, mean, don't you think at some point you and I would look at her and go, how how long have you been sick? 18 years? Ooh. Well, I'll get get someone else to pray for you because if it was like today... (laughs) But Jesus Jesus doesn't treat something like this like it's difficult. And greater is he that's in you than he who's in the world. Right? Jesus Jesus doesn't qualify problems as more difficult than others. Okay? The, the, The zit on the face of a teenager or late stage cancer... There's still problems. And Jesus doesn't look at one and go, ooh, too hard for me. Okay? Nothing is impossible for him. And his desire in all of this, the desire of Jesus, is that this woman would be free, that she would be free to worship the Lord. His desire in this is that she would be led to water or refreshing, if you will. That she would be loosed from the bound or bondage, bindings, ropes, bad junk. (laughs) I should have thought of a better word for all this, but I didn't. But that she would be loosed, 
That, that, when Jesus looks at a problem, maybe it's your problem today, when he looks at that problem, his desire is not, well, that's what you deserve, punk. His desire is, oh, look at her. That's, man, she's struggling. That's, that just breaks my heart. I'm going to do something about this problem. That's the way Jesus responds to stuff. And you and I are supposed to be like Jesus. Everybody, everybody with me? Okay. So, so Jesus performs this miracle, which was not work for him. And he's interrupting natural order to reestablish divine order. And you and I are called to do exactly the same thing. We look at people in the world that are hurting, that are sick, that are broken. We're not supposed to be afraid of that. We're not supposed to be condemning about that. He didn't, like, analyze her all up. The reason you got this demon spirit, he didn't do that. He just said, look, I want you to be free. Freedom comes to your house, lay hands on you, boom, and it's going to happen. Okay, And so we begin to, to see principles, and this is important for us, church, because I believe with all my heart as we approach the end times that, that God wants to see power released in his church. The needs are, are greater than ever. I mean, if you look at the news, the world's a dumpster fire. And we need to see the power of God manifesting. And he wants to release that through the church. And we have to get out of the place of, I'm a big chicken. And get into the place of, I'm going to speak to this. I'm going to compassionately and lovingly see change in this. And that's how we see the power of God manifest. So I want to give you guys five principles relatively quickly. If we get that far, and then we're going to pray for needs. You're looking at your watch, Kenzie. You think I can't do it? What do you think? Okay. Sorry. You good? Okay. Number one. I love you, Red. Number one. Faith is required. Now, it does not say that lady had faith. But I know Jesus did. I'm going to assume that the disciples did because this is Luke 13 and it was back in Luke 9 that Jesus gave them authority and they went out and they did miracles. So that happened in chapter 9. So this is chapter 13. They're coming off a big win. We saw stuff happen. Let's do this. They're in the synagogue. Lady walks in. All the disciples look back and go, Jesus is going to do something cool. So faith is required. And you may say, like, like Glory did, hey, I was really struggling with my faith, but I'm getting to the place where my faith is stronger. I've had a moment with, with the Lord. And guys, the reason we want people to have moments with the Lord is because it's a faith builder. The reason we want you to read your Bible is it is a faith builder. Okay? The reason we talk about the really cool stuff that God does among us is because it's a faith builder. And right now, what you need more than anything else is Faith. Faith is required to see miracles, to see his power. Jesus had faith, and faith will always activate healings in the miracle power of God. Okay? We see, for example, the uh, Mark chapter 5, uh, verses 33 and 34. You know the story. He's on his way to Jairus' house to raise his daughter from the dead. The woman with the issue of blood comes up, reaches out, and touches the hem of his garment. Right? You guys know this story. The Bible says, the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came, fell at his feet, trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. And Jesus said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. He does not say, oh, look, you got lucky. Like, oh, you just stumbled into it. He says, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. So our faith is necessary. We need to activate our faith. And truthfully, it's, it's hard to maintain your faith because we live in a negative world. 
right? And if you ever see, like, pharmacy commercials, right? You know, take this, this will make better. But side effects include death, dismemberment, loss of friends, burps, farts, lose your hair. I mean, all kinds of, you're just like, I don't think I want to take that. You know, and, and, and so we, we live in this, this negative, faithless world. But Jesus says, no, your faith is important. Your faith has made you well. My goal, your goal, my activity in life as yours is to constantly build my faith. Well, maybe you don't need faith right now. Well, that's cool, but you might tomorrow. So build it today. Right? So that when, so when everything's falling apart, you're not going like, oh, where's my Bible? Where's my Bible? It needs to be in you, and you need to be ready because who knows what's going to happen tomorrow. And just as faith activates healing, doubt diminishes power. Again, Mark, love the story. Mark chapter 6, verses 5 and 6. Jesus is in his own hometown. They're being hypercritical of him. Oh, isn't this, isn't this Jesus, the, the son of Joseph the carpenter? Don't we know his siblings? Didn't he make me that table? I know that guy. You know, my, my chairs are kind of wonky. He needs to come back and fix them. And that's what they're thinking, because he was a carpenter. That's what they were thinking. And the Bible says, Mark chapter 6, it says, he could not do any miracles there except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. He was amazed at their, their unbelief or their lack of faith. He was amazed at their lack of faith. So in our, in our room... We need to cultivate faith. Okay, so here in a little bit, we're going to pray over people. He may be right. I don't think I'm going to finish all five. But, but <laughs> in our room, when we're, we're praying for people, if you're, if you're sitting there and you're indignant, I can't believe we're doing this. This is like practicing medicine without a license. These people should go to jail. Ain't nothing gonna happen anyway. That's just stupid. If that's, then you are you are bringing doubt into the picture. What we what we need to be doing is we need to be sitting there going, God, I just I read the Bible. You heal people. You said it's for us today. I'm watching. I'm excited. You're gonna do something. It's gonna be good. Oh, look at that lady. She's hurt. I have compassion for her. God's gonna touch that woman. Whoo! Come on, come on. Pray, pray hard, pray hard, pray hard. And so we, your faith counts when we're praying for people. Your faith count. So, so if you're like all by yourself praying, get ready to minister to somebody, text your friend, pray for me right now, and just start praying. We believe God. We need to cultivate an atmosphere of faith and of belief, and it's hard, and sometimes we, we talk ourselves out of it. Right, hey, I want to, you know, sister, I want to pray for you. You look, you know, you look like you're really going through it. And if your first response is, you can if you want to, but nothing's going to happen. Well, that's a problem that we need to deal with, right? Our response should be more like, man, please pray for me because I'm ready to be done with this junk. All right, God, you got it. Mm -hmm. Does that that make sense? Is there anyone in this room who has faith? God, just making sure. I'm just making sure. How about number two? Can we do number two? Jesus is always willing to heal. And I think this is kind of like a topic of uh, discussion out there, like, you know, Lord, if it be your will, I'm going to pray for you, but if it be your will, Lord, please heal. I don't see anywhere in the New Testament where Jesus goes praying for somebody, or someone comes up, rather, and says, you know, hey, would you heal me? And Jesus is like, I don't, I don't see that. Lord, if you're willing, heal me. He's like, eh, you know, it's a Tuesday. I'm really not in the mood. Monday was really Monday, and today, you know, second Monday. Yeah, I don't see that. Jesus was always willing to heal. We, we talked about a couple weeks ago when we were talking about this, we talked about Matthew chapter 8. I'm just going to read a couple verses real quick. Um, where um, the man with leprosy came up to Jesus, verse 2, and Lord, if you're willing, make me clean. And Jesus reached out his hands. He says, I am willing. He doesn't say, I'm willing this time. 
He doesn't say, I'm willing just because it's you. He doesn't say, I'm willing because, you know, you're so handsome. There's, there's no conditions. It's just like you asked, I'm doing it. Jesus is always willing to work in people's lives. So we need to develop our faith, faith, and we need to realize that Jesus is always willing to do something because Jesus loves me. This I know because the Bible And so if you're struggling with that doubt of, Lord, if it's your will, would you just get over it and begin to believe and understand in your head that Jesus always wants to heal. Because in Jesus' mind, he, giving you healing is like giving you that, that glass of fresh water that you need when you're tired and, and hot. Okay, he's not, it's not like he's, you're asking him to give you something that he, that he doesn't want to. We, we act like we're, like we're just we're begging we're begging him for a dollar when he doesn't want to give us a dollar. You see what I'm saying? That's not his, his, his generosity in this area is abundant. Miracles are not, there's not like there's a, there's a limit on how many there are. All right? It's not like God's up in heaven going, well, today I've only got 10 miracles, so let's see, we'll do three in Ukraine. And Georgia, yeah, y'all don't need none. And we're going to go over here to uh, Mexico. We're going to throw one down. It's not like there's a limit to this because God is abundant. There's not a limit. We should pray as if there were no limits, right? He's going to give you the spirit without measure, John says, right? Ephesians 3.20 tells us that we, we can ask abundantly beyond, and he can do beyond what we can ask or think, and, that, and we need to have that sort of understanding in our mind. And when, when people resist his healing, he looks at them and says, hypocrite. Hypocrite. You trust me for salvation that you can't see, but you won't trust me for a healing that you can. Hypocrite. I ain't trying to make you mad. Now, sometimes, yeah, sometimes we need to be persistent. Right? The, the Syrophoenician woman demonstrates persistence. This is found in Mark chapter 7, verses 27 through 29, where she comes up. She is a foreigner who doesn't deserve healing. And she comes up and says, would you please heal my daughter? And he says, nope. will not give to dogs and she goes hey, hey but dogs get crumbs right unless jeans around and then dogs get pets and and ear scratches and other whatever you know and and so you know she was persistent in her request and he said in this moment your daughter's healed see i think part of our deal here church is that we ask once and quit okay God does not operate like your microwave. Okay? You put, you put that little popcorn thing in the microwave oven, you hit the popcorn button, and your microwave does nothing. You throw it in the trash, you go to Walmart and buy another $40 microwave. And we treat prayer like that. Hey, God, would you do this miracle? Okay, well, forget it. I'll just take care of it myself. Be persistent. Build your faith. Press into it. Does this make any sense? Number three. We're getting there. Miracles point us to God. Why did Jesus perform miracles? To point people towards the Father. Even, even Romans 1 says that it, it, the resurrection was to prove that Jesus was the Son of God. Okay, so miracles always point up. They should never point to a person. Never. Okay? Oh, he healed me. I'm sorry. Jesus healed you. Okay? It's never about the person or the organization or the church, the miracles, the signs and the wonders so you can see, wow, look what happened. I wonder what Father's up to. 
Miracles always point to the Father. We read this two weeks ago, John 20, verse 31. But these are written about the miracles. These are written that you may believe. Miracles happen that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. The purpose for a miracle, for a sign, for a wonder, or for a healing is so that someone can look up and go, wow, I need you. I give you my whole life. I'm submitting my, Lord, my, my life to your lordship, and I'm in this forever. Does that make sense? Jesus is always looking to glorify the Father. The Holy Spirit's always looking to bring people to the Father. When you see a need, a need then, hey, sick person, broken down person, whatever, this need, Jesus is the solution, and the solution is so that that person can say, I'm going to follow Jesus. If there, if there is a cycle, that would be it. A need leads to a miracle, which leads to a salvation. Okay? That is the way that is supposed to work. Number four. Jesus is our theology. Okay, now I know that Bill Johnson wrote a book that said the title was uh, Jesus is Perfect Theology. I haven't read it. If you read it and already highlighted it, you can let me borrow it for a week and I'll get that done. But Jesus is our theology. If Jesus did it, then I need to look at it and go, okay, that's what I'm doing. That's what I mean by this. Okay? Jesus is our theology. Now, now, pay attention for just a second. A lot of Christians struggle with something that's called cognitive dissonance. Okay? Which is where you are embracing two contradictory ideas. Okay? And so that causes your brain to melt. Okay? And so cognitive dissonance is... I'm sick and I'm always going to be sick. Jesus healed people. And so you can't, you can't embrace both of these. And so you, you forget that one. Okay, does that make sense? And our theology, most important words I'm going to say, our theology is not based on our experience. Our theology is based on Jesus. Okay? Your theology should not be based on you. And we see this a lot in the world today. All right? Um, hey, you know, God is a loving father. And we sit back and we go, oh, well, my father was a jerk. My father was absent. My father was abusive. My father was whatever, whatever, whatever. Therefore, God must be the same. Okay? That's basing your theology on your experience instead of basing your theology on what Scripture says. Jesus is your theology. Okay? Hey, I believe that the Bible shows me that Jesus was a healer, but I look at my own life and I'm not there yet. Which one am I going to choose? I'm either going to choose my negative experience or I'm going to put my faith in Jesus. And that's, that's the cognitive dissonance. That's the, the breakdown in our thought patterns. And you embrace all the negativity, and, it's really, and then your, your doubt just flourishes. Or we look at Jesus, and we keep looking at Jesus, and we turn to Jesus again. And, hey, my life isn't lining up, so life, get yourself in line with Jesus. What would Jesus do if he walked into the room? That's what my, my theology needs to be not what my experience was. And I'm coming from a place so that you don't, I want, don't want you to think that, that I'm just like my life is perfect and, and I'm making it up. And I've seen people close to me die. Right? I've, re I've had people tell me, you know, oh, the Lord told me your mom's going to live and five days later she dies. And you go, hmm. Well, does that mean prophecy is out the door? No, that just means that guy missed it. He was speaking from a place of hope, not from a place of understanding. Okay? I've prayed for healing in my body and healing in my family and seen it not happen. If I were, if I were to embrace that as my theology, 
then I would never ever pray for someone to be healed. But I, I embrace what scripture says. And so I've seen miracles, and maybe it's, maybe it's one out of 20 times or one out of 30 times, but still it's one. Okay? I may have told you guys this story. There was a time when, when Zach was a little kid, Elena was at work, it was my day off, uh, I got the kids, he's across the street, they're playing t-ball with a lead pipe and a golf ball. What could possibly go wrong? And I'm sitting in, I'm sitting in my driveway in like one of those old lawn chairs, it's kind of a mesh thing like this, and I'm like reading the paper, and they're across the street, and it's like whatever, and then one of the kids, and Zach was playing catcher. Right, yeah, that's cool. And so this kid swings the pipe, it catches Zach right here in the nose. And you could see, like, the, <laughs> the, the gauge of the pipe in his nose. It was, like, curved inward, right? And it was just like, <gasps> that's a problem. And the, and the neighbor lady, she was Nancy, she was, like, all wigged out about it, and I'm sure she was worried we were going to sue her or whatever, and so he takes Zach inside, and he's crying like a, like a kid who's got hit in the face with a pipe, and there's blood and whatever. And so I call Elena. She's at work. And I, <clears throat> hey, babe. <laughs> so um, just curious, the uh, health insurance we got, <laughs> what hospital does that cover? <laughs> like, who's in, who's in our network, you know? <laughs> and she's like, why are you asking? No reason. There's no reason. In the background, you hear, there's no reason, man. It's all cool. (laughs) So we end up in the emergency room with our kid, and he was in the emergency room a lot. We had the frequent punch card. (laughs) Ten visits, the next one's (laughs) Next one's free. And the doctor comes in and looks and goes, ooh. So we're going to have to do surgery. You know, we're going to have to, you know, like, stick a thing up his nose and pop it back out and I don't know what I know it's all right and and I'm sitting there thinking oh no this is terrible that dumb kid with a pipe what's up (laughs) (laughs) oh you want to know what happened yeah so so like 10 minutes later mama shows up starts praying over him and we got sent home from the hospital with a whole child with no medical procedures done. Okay? And if you want to look at his face right now, he's so handsome. Right? And just, I mean, just, just think, you're not going to be able to sing and lead worship if your nose is crushed back into your skull forever. Can you imagine So what Satan had meant for evil, God turned into a miracle. And so I hang my faith on that one, not on, hey, these other things have not come to pass. Because I'm not going to build my theology based on my experience. I'm going to build my theology based on the scripture that says that Jesus was willing to heal them, and he did. And Jesus spoke a word, and she was set free. And, and, and Moses stuck out his stick and parted the red. That's, that's where my theology is based, and yours should be as well. Don't build your theology based on you. That is so egocentric. It should be, is, is Christocentric, is that a word in English? It is in Spanish, right? Christocentrico. There's not an equivalent for that? Well, dang, Christ-centered. Oh, thanks. Hey, thanks for interpreting. What? It is? All right, thanks. I I need help with that. So, Christocentric. Christ. Really, Christocentric? It just sounds better in Spanish. Y'all just say say with me. Say, Christocentrico. There it is. So, John 14, 12. Jesus speaks and says, very truly I tell you, whatever, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these, because I, Jesus, am going to the Father. 
Okay? So here's what we're, here's what we're going to do. I'm just going to give you number five. We're going to come back to number five later. Number five is Jesus gave authority to the 12. We will talk about authority next week because I don't have time and I don't want to run it through. So, however, I would like to take some time and pray for people that are sick. Okay? And it's not about me. It's about us and our faith. Okay? So, if you are on our normal altar prayer team, get ready. Okay? If you need healing in your body, hey, I got this that I don't think is what I need to have, right? If you're ugly, that's, that's a different thing. But if, <laughs> if you got a lump you shouldn't have or you've got blood pressure that's through the roof or your whatever is whatever, you need a healing touch in your body. I just want you to raise your hand real quick. Okay? Good. So we're going to pray for you guys. Here's how we're going to do it. If you are on the prayer team or if you're in the school of ministry and you did not raise your hand that you need a healing, I'm going to ask you to come up here to the front facing the back wall. Okay. If you raised your hand and we're doing, again, we're doing this, this is about faith, it's not about hype. Okay? Hype faith disappears just as fast as it got here. If you need healing in your body, I want to ask you to come up and ask one of these guys to pray over you. Dwight, I love it, man. You're pushing Miss Linda up to the front. Believe in God for healing in her body. If you need healing in your body, I'm just going to say, I'm just going to say step out of your seat, be a person of faith. Walk up, believe God for healing in your body. Those of you that are up here at the front, just lay hands on them, begin to pray over them. If you want to ask them a question, hey, what am I praying about, then you can. But let's just, let's just trust God. Build your faith. If you're not coming forward, I saw people raise their hands. You have not come up yet. Okay, just begin to pray over people. If you're sitting in your seat and you're not sick in your body, I just want you to just begin to pray because your faith counts as well. Your faith counts in this situation in which, you say, in which you say, God, I believe you to touch my friends. I believe you to touch my church family. I believe you to touch that lady or that guy. You may not know what's going on in their bodies, but you know what Jesus is capable of doing. Okay? So let's just pray. Let's just believe. Let's just pray. Let's just believe. God is a healing God. Jesus is a healer. Jesus looked at the woman and he said, you are, you are healed. You are set free. He looked at her and he said, you are set free from this infirmity. So, Father God, we believe you today for healing in bodies. We believe you today for healing in bodies in this room. And I thank you for it. Just pray. Pray in faith. Pray believing. The faith counts more than the words count. Father, I just thank you for it. I thank you for it, Lord Jesus. Could you turn Zach's mic on? Yes, Father, I just thank you. Just thank you, Lord, for healing. I think if you're sitting on your seat, just build your faith. Build your faith. We're trusting God for good things. Yes, Jesus. I believe in you. I believe in you. You're the God of miracles. I believe. Yes, Jesus. You're the God of me. Yes, yes, Jesus. Mm. Thank you, Father. I believe. Yes. Mm. 
When Jesus touches you, I want to hear it. I want to hear it when Jesus touches you. Give me a shout. Give me a wave, something. Thank you, Father, for your healing power. Thank you for your healing power, Lord. Yes. I believe in you. You're the God of miracles. Yes, Jesus. Mm. I believe in you. I believe in you. You're the God of miracles. Yes, Lord. I believe in you, Abba. I believe in you. You're the God of miracles, I know it. I believe in you. I believe in you. You're the God of miracles. believe you at your word, Lord. You are a healer. You reveal yourself as a healer. Even from, even from the Old Testament, even from the book of Exodus, you said, I am Jehovah Rapha. I am the God who heals. 
Father, we thank you that Jesus walked around doing good because he was anointed by the Holy Spirit to do good and to heal people and to set them free, Acts 10, 38. And we thank you for it today in the name of Jesus. And Father, I pray that you would stir us to be faith-filled, praying people. Lord, it's not our responsibility to make it happen. It's our responsibility to say the prayer and to believe you for it. Father, I thank you that you reestablish your divine order in our lives, in our bodies, in our businesses, in our homes. Father, I thank you. Father, I thank you that we are wonderfully, beautifully made. And we believe you for healing power, Lord. Healing power. Just manifest, Father, in Jesus' name. Father, I thank you those that are watching online, Father, they receive healing right now in their bodies, in their homes, in their living rooms. I thank you that you touch bodies and you bring healing in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. We just trust you. We thank you for it. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Mm. Jesus, your love is more than enough for me. Surely you took my pain and bore my suffering. Jesus. Mm. Thank you, Father. Mm. Father, I just thank you that even when we're at home and we're online watching, Father, I thank you that you're a great healer. So, Father God, we speak life. Speak life over our friends and family that are online. Father, I speak to that small child that's, that's homesick, and I say be healed in the name of Jesus. Pastor Merle just came up to me and said he felt like there's someone at home who's struggling with some some colon issues that God wants to unknot and bring life and healing in the name of Jesus. So, Father, we just thank you for it. We thank you for it. Yes, Lord. Mm. Yes, Jesus. Mm. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Now, these guys up here at the altar, y'all keep praying. If you received prayer this morning and felt like God touched your body in a special way, I'm going to ask you to just raise, raise your hand and wave at us this morning. I got one, I got two, I got three, I got four, five people, six people, seven people. So, Father God, we glorify you. We thank you. I thank you that you're a wonderful and amazing healing God. Father, as we we go, I pray, Father God, that you do an amazing work. Father, help us to believe you and to build our faith and to trust you for more. We bless you and we thank you today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're going to be dismissed. I believe we have prophetic teams today. If you want to get prayed for by the prophetic teams, they'll be down the hall in a couple minutes. They'd love to pray over you. Those of you that are praying at the altar, feel free to hang out and pray as long as you wish to. Um, We love you guys. We bless you. Have an amazing, beautiful, God-filled day.